we've been doing a series titled Emmanuel. And in this series, we've looked at the name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And so we looked at the dynamics of the name of Jesus and how in Isaiah 7, 14, God says that I will, I will show you a sign. I'll give you a sign. You'll know that this is the one because a virgin will conceive and you will call the, the child Emmanuel. Then we get to Matthew chapter 1, and we see the angel come to, to Joseph and tell Joseph, name the child Jesus. We learn that Jesus is what he does because his name means Yah saves or the Lord is salvation. We learn Emmanuel is, what he, is who he is. He, he saves us. That's what he does. Emmanuel means that he is with us. And I came to tell someone today, no matter where you are, no matter where you're at today, that God is with you. We learn that we learn the withness of God, that no matter where we are, no matter what we are doing, God is with us in all of it. Then we also learn that that God is with us in the fire. That as believers over and over again, we'll see that that there are times in our lives, specific points in our life where our faith will be faced with an ultimatum. You will have to choose who you will serve. And we learn that even in the face of adversity, even in the face of calamity, when we have to make a choice whether to go our own way or, or, or be molded by the culture or trust God, we learn that even when we trust him and put him first, that God shows up in the fire. God shows up in the fire. Thank you for the three people who have ever been in fire. God bless you. <laughs> the rest of us are still trying to get the boogers out and clean our eyes. I, by the way, just give you it's for free. My, my eyes, I'm just sweating. My eyes were just sweating. That's all that was. Some, every once in a while, your eyes sweat. You know, sometimes you got to get a towel and hydrate yourself when your eyes sweat. Praise the Lord. But, but we also learned that he is with us. Another thing we learned um, is that God is with us, we learned this last week, in the wait. That in the wait, God is with us. And I just have to say this out loud because someone asked me uh, after the last service, Hey, Pastor David, did you get your package? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you how good God is. I did get the package. Thank you. So I don't know if they're watching live, but I got the package on Monday. But watch how God works. Someone I did not know, someone who did not work for FedEx, UPS, or the post office, a man got the package delivered to his house, drove to my house, rung the doorbell. I saw him on the ring. I said, sir, can I help you? <laughs> can I help you? How can I help you? He said, I just wanted to, I just, I drove here because this package is not mine. It was dropped off of my address and I wanted to make sure you got it. God will use people you don't even know <laughs> to bless you. So we, so we got the package. We got the package. Um, today, today's, I need y'all to, to pray with me. I'm the prayer warriors, y'all right here. I see you right here. I need you to pray with me. Today, today is going to be a little challenging, but I need you to roll with me. Can you do that? Amen. Amen. Today, I, I want us to look at God, Emmanuel, God with us in the struggle. Emmanuel, God with us in the struggle. Emmanuel, God with us in the struggle. Um, I, I don't know about you. I don't know where you are in your life at this point, but when um, I look at where I am, there was a crucial moment in my life um, that I had to make a decision. And many of us have already began planning for 2020. We, we've already made strategic plans for what we will do. And uh, there was a pivotal moment in my life where I could see clearly to an extent, what God was about to do in my life. But he wouldn't release it. And I learned that the reason he would not release it, because he could not afford for my talent to take me where my character couldn't keep me. And so, and so we're going to learn today that no matter how many plans you have made, no, mat no matter how many meetings you've went to, 
no matter how many seminars and webinars you've went to and sat at a table with a vision, sometimes God will not release what he's going to release into your life until he first deals with you. <laughs> he, he can't afford it. One of the reasons he can't afford it is because his name is on it. <laughs> and he can't afford to be embarrassed. And he can't afford, there, there are too many lives at stake that it will touch. So he cannot allow, he cannot release it into your life until he deals with your character. And for somebody, God says, I'm, I'm not going to change. I'm not worried about changing the things around you. What I want to change is within you. <laughs> and, and so we get to this text, and we, we're going to see a man who, who, who did everything he possibly could to get ahead. But at this particular moment in his life, God would not allow, he would not release this covenant blessing into his life until God could first deal with his character. The promise was his. What God was going to do was definitely his. And, and it was waiting to be his because first God needed to deal with him. And I came to tell someone today, God is with you in your struggle. God is with you in your struggle. In fact, when we get to Genesis 29 in a moment, you'll see that, that uh, this, this man by the name of Jacob, he, he, um, he, he had what David, David, uh, David reminds me, he says that I was born in iniquity. I was, I was shaped in iniquity. And, and it, it, is, it is the revelation that uh, when you have a child, you don't, you don't have to teach them how to tell you no. <laughs> you, you have a child, it's like, they, they're just, you tell them to do something? No. Two years old, just rebellious. You, you don't have to teach them. There's something in them that, that causes them to go contrary to the direction that you tell them to go. It's in us. And, and this, this child, Jacob, was, was uh, in his mother's womb, he was already tricky. He, he had a twin brother named Esau. When Esau, the, the mother actually prayed to God, said, Some, there's, there's too much wrestling going on in here. There, there, there's something that... that Something's going on. Lord, what is it? And, and he revealed him that you have, a, you have twins. And, and when, when Esau came out first, Jacob grabbed his heel. And, and Jacob, uh, Esau's name, he got his name because when he came out, he was real, he, like Yogi Bear, he was real furry, real hairy. When he came out, he was very hairy. And so they named him Esau. But Jacob got the name Jacob because it, mean, it, was, it was an idiom for, for deceiver or trickster. It was a Hebrew idiom for the word trickster because even in his mother's womb, he was already tricky. When he was in his mother's womb, he was already wrestling and grappling and, and, and trying to get ahead by any means necessary. And so here he is, and, and his parents pray, and they find out that he, 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 he's struggling. But then we see as he gets older that the trickery didn't change. He, he, he ends up um, stealing his brother's birthright. And his brother goes out, Esau's out, he, he had a long day, he was working really hard, and he comes back from, from working really hard. He, the, the text says he was famished. He didn't have anything left in him. He, was, he said, I'm so hungry, I'm going to die. His brother stood at the, at the pot and says, you can't have any of this until you first give me your birthright. And he was kind of frustrated. None, none, of you, none of you that have siblings or family members ever had this problem. He, he was frustrated because his, because his brother came out first, his brother would receive a double portion of the blessing. And the only reason, he, I mean, his brother probably missed him, was ahead of him by a minute and a half, two minutes or less. And he could not get the blessing. So could you imagine being a twin? And you, you couldn't divide it evenly? The custom was to give it to the oldest one, and the oldest one is the one who came out first. And so he says, I'm going to get the birthright. And so he deceives his brother into giving him his birthright, and his brother is so famished, he gives him, he said, you can have it, and he takes the pot. And how they would divide it, if it was two people, uh, they would divide the blessing up in three. And the person who was oldest would get two, and the, the younger one would get the, the last one. 
And so you would get a double blessing, and you would, you'd just get one blessing. And, and he was so frustrated, he found a way to be tricky or to be a trickster or deceiver to get what he wanted. Then when he's, his, his, bro, his, his mom overhears the dad about to bless Esau because he's getting old now, he then deceives his father. His father's senses, his, his sensibility was gone. And so he, he, he tricked his dad into believing he was, he was Esau so he could re- receive the patriarch blessing. And so he takes this blessing from his brother and he takes his brother's blessing from his father. And he always got ahead deceiving people. He would make plans. He would make schemes and strategies to get whatever he wanted. And his, when his brother found out, first, now you got my birthright. Now you have the patriarch blessing. He runs to his dad and says, don't you have anything left for me? His dad says, no. All that I have, I gave to your brother because he deceived me. And so he said, I got a plan. When my father is gone, I'm going to kill Jacob. And so when he finds out that his brother is going to kill him, he flees. And he goes and stays with a relative named Laban. This is when the struggle begins. Turn with me to Genesis 29, and let's see the struggle begin. Genesis 29. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is, what is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Watch this. Long, this is about 20, 27 chapters. So I got to break it down, okay? He, he, he goes to stay with his uncle Laban. He sees Rachel. He says, I got I, that, That's my woman. That's my wife. I got to be with her. He says, Laban, what do I have to do? He says, work for me seven years. And you can have her. So he works for seven years, and Laban tricks him and gives him Leah instead of Rachel. Then he, he wakes up. He's like, what is this? Then he has to work seven more years to get Rachel. He had to work twice as hard as he was supposed to to get what he desired. But when, God, when you're in a struggle and God is trying to change and form and mold your character, sometimes God has to prune you to prepare you for what he has for you. Sometimes God will prune you to prepare you. Sometimes in your journey with God, he will prune you to prepare you. How does he do it? Well, God allows him. You know, when I was a kid, I used to get in trouble sometimes, sometimes. My grandma had this saying, one one day you're going to get a taste of your own medicine. Anybody ever heard that? One day. You're going to get a taste of your own medicine. And so here he is, a trickster, and the, the, the deceiver gets deceived. The trickster gets tricked. And now he has to work twice as hard to get what he desired because God allowed him to get a taste of his own medicine. Sometimes God will allow you to get a taste of your own medicine to prune you and shape you, because sometimes you don't know how it feels to do somebody wrong. And so the only way you might change your ways or begin to change your way of thinking is by you going through what you do to other people. I know y'all ain't praying with me no more. Uh, it, sometimes God has to, to, to allow you to, 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 to receive it. What about the, uh, the, the person who, who uh, I'm going to look up when I say this, who, who deceived the person they were dating. I'm still looking up. And you made them think they were the only one, made them feel like you were going to stay with them for the rest of your life, made them feel like it was only them, only to find out there was more than one and you were never faithful in the first place. But the whole time you deceived them, and now you reach the point in your life where you found somebody you love. And sometimes you have to learn how it feels to have a broken heart to learn how to handle somebody that God places in your life. Some, some, y'all don't want to pray with me, but sometimes God would allow you to go through what you do to other people so you won't do what you do to other people. 
What, 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 what about the uh, person who, just, you know, shady business practices? You, you, you don't care about your employees. You just lay people off. You do whatever you got to do to get the money. And then somehow you find yourself in the same predicament and you find yourself through all the people you laid off because they didn't do what you, not because they didn't do what the job asked them to do, but because they didn't do what you wanted them to do. And so you laid them off, and now you find yourself in the back of the unemployment line, just like the same people you did wrong, because God will let you know what it feels like to go through something, so you'll never do somebody like that again. Uh, let me help you. Uh, it's, not, it's not karma. Let me help you guys out. It's not karma. I, I, I get a, 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 a spiritual migraine when Christians say, oh, that's karma. That's karma. This is the reason why I get a spiritual migraine, because there's a difference between karma and reaping what you sow. <laughs> karma means no matter what you've done, no matter when you've done it or did it, it at some point in your lifetime, no matter what happens, no matter who you've become, no matter how you've changed, at some point in your life, it will come back around and get you. That's karma. When you, when you deal with karma, which is not biblical, you can't sleep at night. You sleep, you, you sleep in fear because in the back of your mind, you're always waiting or expecting calamity to come when you think about what you did. That's why I can't roll with karma because karma doesn't leave room for God's grace. See, reaping and sowing means what I sow, I reap. But I'm never in charge of the harvest. God's always in charge of the harvest. That means what I sow, God is the one who allows me to reap. So even when I've done wrong, Sometimes God will not allow you to go through what you should go through and suffer the consequences because as he's shaping you and molding you to be the man or woman of God he's called you to be because he's in charge of the reaping and the harvest, he'll say, no, my hand's still on them. I'm not going to allow them to go through that because it leaves room for God's mercy and it leaves room for God's grace. Mercy is when you don't receive what you do deserve. And God loves you so much that while he's shaping and molding your character, he won't allow you to go through what you should go through because grace grabs a hold of you. I need somebody to help me praise God that you don't live your life based on karma and fear. You can live your life in peace and liberty knowing, Lord, I know I messed up. Lord, I know I did it. But you've changed me and shaped me to the man or woman of God you've called me to be. And I may do something else, but I promise you I will never do that again. Sometimes you have to just thank God that he redeems our past through the blood of Jesus Christ so you don't have to sleep in fear. He came to set the captive free. He came to give you an abundant life, and I came to let somebody know you need to live a life of liberty and freedom in Jesus Christ. God can withhold your past from coming back to haunt you. Amen? He, he does not allow him to suffer the consequences all the way for what he had done. God, God, as he shapes his, he begins to prune him. He allows him to go through what he went through to let him know how it feels. But all the while, God's hand is still on him as he's shaping and molding his character. That's the first thing. In your struggle, God will prune you for what he's prepared for you. Second thing, in your struggle, God will protect you from yourself. In your struggle, God will protect. Yes, he will. He will protect you from yourself. Let's go to verse 31 and 3. This is what it says. Then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will, here's the word again, I will be with you. Emmanuel, God with us. I will be with you. Now scroll down a little bit further and to, to verse 19. When Laban had gone to shear the sheep, Rachel stole the father's household gods. Moreover, Jacob, here it is again, deceived Laban by telling him he was not, by not telling him he was running away. Watch verse 20. So he fled with all he had, crossed the Euphrates River, and headed to a hill from the country of Gilead. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. Taking his relatives with him, he pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him on the hill of Gilead. Watch this. Then God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream at night and said to him, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Here we have Jacob. 
deceiving again. But when he's deceived this time, he's not deceiving him out of gain. He's deceiving him out of fear. God tells him, you have to go back now and face your failures and your fears. He's so afraid of facing his mistake. He's so afraid of facing his past. He's so afraid of leaving where he is and doesn't know what Laban might do that he, he said, the best thing for me to do is to just run. Instead of going to tell Laban, hey, Laban, the Lord has told me my season here is up. It's time for me to go. He says the best thing for me to do is he resorts back to what he knows is in him. Have you ever <laughs> resorted back to doing some things you know you shouldn't do, but that was all you knew how to do? And so even in the midst of fear, you just resort back to what you do? And so he goes back to doing what he used to do, and the Lord, even though God is molding his character. Laban's coming after him. He's furious. Instead of allowing Laban to touch his life, God shows up and tells Laban, whatever you do, don't, put your, don't touch him because I still have my hand on him. That's somebody's word. You, you, you did make the mistake. And while God is shaping you and molding you, he's letting the enemy know you can't touch him. I know they messed up. I know they made a mistake, but I'm not going to allow you to touch him because my hand is on him. And there are men and women in this room right now that you've made mistakes. You've done things you're not proud of. And even in the midst of your mistake, God will not allow the enemy to get a hold of you. Because sometimes God loves you so much that he'll protect you from yourself. Sometimes God will protect you from the decisions that you make. You're not proud of it, but sometimes God will step in and stop you from experiencing what you should for what you did do. God loves you so much that even when you become a wrongdoer and you offend somebody and they're coming after you to get you because you know you did it, God can tell them and talk to their heart and let them know, I know they did you wrong, but I don't want you to react. I don't want you to act. I want you to let them go because my hand is is still on them. Some of us have done criminal activity. Everybody around you got busted. Some people you know went to jail, but by the grace of God, he didn't allow you. You did the crime, but you didn't do the time, all because God still had his hand on you, and he said, down the road, there's some things I want to do through her life. Down the road, there's some things I want to do through his life, and so even though you did do it, he won't allow you to suffer the consequences for what you know you did. Because God, when God loves you and he's shaping your character, he keeps his hand on you. And even when you're guilty, the enemy cannot touch you because God says, that's my child. I'm not finished with them yet. There's someone in this room right now. God's word to you is, I'm not finished with you yet. My hand is still on you. Even though you're still struggling, my hand is on you. Even though you're still struggling, my hand is on your job. Even though you're still struggling, my hand is on your family. Even though you're still struggling, my hand is on your marriage. Even though you're struggling, my hand is on your children. I'm not finished with you yet, so I won't allow the enemy to take you out, even though you did do it. You've got to learn how to thank God when he holds on to you and stops the enemy from attacking you. What about, what, what about you? Have you ever just felt so much pain that you threw anything to numb it? And if somebody went through the same thing you went through, they would have given up. You, you may have even tried to give up on yourself. And you woke up in the morning surprised that you were still alive because God is so God, he won't even allow the dosage you use to take you out because God can tell the dosage, stop, my hand is still on them. I love God because even when I mess up, he has an ability to keep me from myself. That's why David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Pastor JP, why would he say that? Well, here's the reason. A rod is used to protect me when the enemy comes after me. And so when the enemy's attack comes, God's able to use his rod to stop the enemy's attack. But I don't really love the rod so much. I'm thankful to God for the staff. What God does with the staff is that because there's some sheep in me, every once in a while, I don't do what God has told me to do, and I go astray. And when I begin to walk this way, when God told me to go this way, he gets his staff and he hooks me back and pulls me back and brings me back all because he loves me. God will save you from your crazy self when you make mistakes and decisions that don't glorify him. 
Praise God for the times when you know you did it, you know you went in the wrong direction, but he loved you so much that even when he's changing your character in the struggle, he'll save you. You serve a God that loves you so much that even when you make bad decisions, he still has his hand on you. He still has his hand on you. God is with you in the struggle. The decision that's on your mind right now, the pain that you're experiencing right now, that you caused, God said, I'm with you in the struggle because God needed Jacob to know you cannot receive what I have for you with this type of character. I love you, and I love you so much that I won't allow you to destroy what I have for your future. And I love you so much that I will stop you, I will protect you from the enemy, and I'll protect you from yourself. <laughs> and God still won't release this covenant blessing because he still has a little residue from the deceptive powers that had a hold of him. He, his granddad was a deceiver. His dad was a deceiver. And he'd become a deceiver. God says, I want to break the generational curse that's on your life. The generational curse that's in your family. Those things you've seen your family struggle with, I want to bless you to the extent that the things you've seen your family go through, you won't go through it. And I'll use you to change a whole generation that when I get my hand on you, I can shift the generation so that now when they look at dad, they can see something they've never seen before. Now when they see mom, they can see something that they've never seen before, all because God wants to change your character in your struggle. God wants to change you, shape you, mold you in the struggle. But not only does God, uh, is he with you in the struggle to prune you. Not only is he in the struggle to help you from yourself, but God is also with you in the struggle because in the struggle, you will wrestle with God. In the struggle, you'll wrestle with God. Go to verse 32. 30, chapter 32, verse 22 says this. That night, Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the, the fort of Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. A man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so his hip was wrenched or, or out of place as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let go unless you bless me. <laughs> the man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name is no longer Jacob, it's Israel. Because you have struggled, there's the word, with God and with humans and have overcome. You with me? Here it is. God is in the struggle, you'll wrestle with God. In your struggle, you'll wrestle with God. Now, Jacob realizes he has to go see his brother. There's no way around it. In order for him to receive this covenant blessing, he has to face his fears. He has to face his failure. And he's tried every tricky thing he could possibly do. And now he sends his possessions over. And he realizes that all the plans that I've, I've, I've sought and come up with, they're not working. Because what he does, he sends some gifts ahead to his brother and tells the people to send it. And the, the, the people come back with a report saying, hey, just want you to know, Jacob, we saw your brother. He's coming with 400 men. What do you mean? So now he becomes afraid. And he says, wait a minute. You mean he's coming after me with 400 men? So now he's, he's, he's even more afraid than he was before. Because now he says, well, why would he come? If I'm bringing him gifts... Why would he bring 400 men with him? So now he tried to split up his family, and he has two different camps of his family, splits up his possessions, and now he's, he's waiting all by himself, trying to contemplate, what do I do next? Have you ever been in a situation, and you tried everything you possibly could, and it still seemed like it wasn't working? You've done everything, dotted every I, crossed every T, and somehow it's still not working? Then he's by himself, and God shows up. We, we learn God showed up in the fire, pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, and when God shows up in the camp when he's by himself, 
He begins to wrestle with him. Then he says to himself, I won't let go until you bless me. In this struggle, in this wrestling match, three things happen. He, he changes his mindset, he changes his identity, and he changes his walk. Give it to you again. He changes his mindset, he changes his identity, and he changes the way that he walks. And when he gets to the point where he realizes, I've tried everything I possibly can, and it's not working. When he says, I won't let go until you bless me, it means, it, it, it has the connotation of understanding that, I've tried everything I can, and I'm relinquishing my own will. I'm relinquishing my own desire, and I'm going to hold on to you until you bless me how you said you would bless me. Lord, I surrender all. I surrender my own plans. I surrender my own schemes. I surrender my, deci my, my deceptive acts. The, the thing in me that you weren't pleased of, I surrender it, and I know I cannot go forward unless you're with me. I don't want you to bless me financially. I want you to bless me with your presence. And he says, Lord, I'll go over to my brother, but I can't go to my brother if you're not with me. Somebody's in this room, and there's a plan. There's something that God is going to do next. You've tried everything you can, and you will not be able to make it unless God is with you. Now, let me give you this for free. He, he would not let go of the man. The man said, let go of me. He said, I'm not letting go until you bless me. The man says, let go of me. Now, we know that the man, God himself, was not being overpowered because he was weak. You, you ever, um, when, I, when I was younger, I used to, dads, raise your hand real quick, grandparents, granddads, dads, raise your hand. You, you, you have a good time wrestling with your son? It was amazing, right? You, 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 would, uh, you wrestle, I used to wrestle with my dad, we would wrestle, and, and I, I'm, I'm hitting my dad with everything I, I possibly have. And my dad just sitting there like, holding me by my head, letting me hit him. I'm wrestling him, I'm grabbing him. And, and then the last thing I did is I, I, would, I would jump, I'm, I'm going to get him to fall down. I'm going to wrestle him to the ground. And so I'll grab my dad's foot, and I would be, he, he'd just be dragging me. <laughs> he'd just be dragging me. And, and I'm doing everything I possibly can, because I'm not letting go. Yeah. I'm not letting go, God. I'm not letting go. And, and, and then every once in a while, my dad will remind me that he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> every once in a while, he'd give me a, a quick little, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Now, the only reason why it looks like you're winning is because I'm letting you win. Yeah. But the reason why I'm letting you win is because I want to bless you. The reason why I'm letting you win is because I want to build your confidence. The reason why I'm letting you win is because I want to build your assurance. The reason why I'm letting you win is because I want to build some character and identity of you that you won't be afraid of me or be afraid of anybody else you wrestle. And so God would allow me to wrestle with my dad to build my confidence in who I was as a man. And in this match, God is allowing him to wrestle because God wants to let him know I'm still God, but I got you. And so while they wrestle, God allows him to hold on to him until he is blessed. Someone's here. God's not going to allow you to leave his presence without getting blessed. You've got to trust him enough to realize it can't work out without him in it. And I'm not letting go until you bless me. See if I can help you out. There's a woman who had an issue of blood. She tried everything she possibly could, and it didn't work out. She paid doctors. She paid, she wasted all her money only to find out she was still sick. She said to herself, if I could just grab a hold of Jesus, <laughs> it, 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 if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I'll be well. And, and, and Jesus, I'm not letting go until you bless me. And, and she grabbed the hem of his garment and the word of God says, and immediately she was whole. And the minute she was made whole, she said she realized that her body was healed, and so she let go because she decided that she would not let go of him until she got her blessing. Somebody's in here, and there's a transforming touch that you have when you hold, grab a hold of God, and God's telling you today that you do not let go until he blesses you because when he blesses you, he changes you because our identity changed. The next thing in the text is that he changed his, his, his mentality, then he changed his identity. What do you mean, Pastor JP? Well, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. 
God would not allow him to go forward identified by who he used to be. God wouldn't allow him to go forward identified by his past. God wouldn't let him go forward being called what he used to be. He says, now your name is, is Israel because you have, you've struggled with God and you've prevailed. You wrestled with me. And in the wrestle, I was able to change you and transform you and give you a new identity. And in your struggle, God will change you. He will shape you. He will mold you and give you a new identity because you are not your last mistake. You're not who you used to be because in Christ, we're a new creation. And he tells him, now you have a new identity. And the person that's in here now, you have a struggle. There's something in you that you're wrestling with. God's word for you today is, you're not who you used to be. You're, you're not your past. You're not your last mistake. You're, you're not your last mistake. But, but then God changes his mindset, changes his identity, then he changes his walk. Isn't it interesting that, that the text says in, 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 in chapter 33, that when he, was, when he began to move in 32, 31, it says that he, he walked with a limp. He, he walked with a limp. And so now he didn't walk the same. God did something to his walk that, that, that as, as he went to even see his brother, he didn't walk the same. He, he, he's going to his brother and 400 men are coming to kill him. And not only is he mentally afraid, but now he physically can't defend himself. Because now he has to walk with a limp. He's struggling to learn how to walk. He's struggling with a limp because when you have an encounter with God, God changes your walk. Why is it significant? Well, sometimes we praise God that when we go through things in life, like when the brothers went through the fiery furnace, the word of God says when they came out on the other side, their clothes weren't stenched, they came out. Like nothing happened. And we praise God that we don't look like what we've been through. Sometimes you do look like what you've been through. And the greatest testimony you have is, God, I thank you that I made it. Because champions don't quit. Sometimes the true champion through the struggle, you look like what you went through, but God will allow you to raise your hand in victory because you still went 12 rounds. You may have got punched around, but by the grace of God, all you can say is I'm still standing. You may be walking with a limp, but you still made it. You may be going through, but you still made it. Sometimes you got to tell the devil, I may be limping, but I still made it. I may be trotting, but I still made it. Cancer may have took my hair, but I still made it. I still have a limp, but I still made it. I may have a bad back from a car accident, but I still made it. Sometimes the greatest testimony you have is that you do look like what you went through because God reminds you that he's with you, and the only reason you made it is by the grace and the mercy of God. When I had my car accident, people said, Pastor JP, you kind of walking with a walking kind of cool. We kind of walking kind of cool, Pastor JP. I said, you don't know the pain I'm in, but I'm praising God that I came out on the other side. Sometimes you have to praise God when you do look like what you went through because the testimony that the only reason why I'm still standing is because God is with me. God will change your walk, and after you change your walk, he'll change your talk. Who's that for? God will change the way that you walk so the way that you talk will be a way that glorifies him for all that he's done through your life. He changed the way that he walked. And every time he walked, he was reminded that his name was changed. He was reminded that God said, I'm going to bless you. He was reminded that I've made it through it. Through hell or high water, I'm still here. And now I'm not afraid to go before you because I wrestled with God and he told me he's going to bless me. So I look in the face of the enemy and I stand tall because God is with you. Yeah. One, of, one, of, one of my friends, amazing testament, went, went through tra tragedy and lost their brother at a, at a young age and 
and, and then doing ministry and serving and, and had, had cancer and got diagnosed with cancer. And, and it's almost like all these sermons together because she was so bold. She said, listen, either God's going either he's gonna to take it away, but whatever God decides to do, I'm okay with it. Came back weeks ago, told me, Pastor JP, you're not going to believe it. As of today, I'm cancer-free. She walked up, rolled up with, with no hair on her head, but she praised God. I may look like what I went through, but I praise God that I'm still here. Sometimes the greatest testimony you have is that God kept you in the fire and God kept you in the fight. She struggled with her faith. She struggled with God. But sometimes the greatest testimony you have is that I do look like I, what I went through, but it's a testimony that God is with you. She, she made it through the fire. She made it through the struggle because she determined in her mind, if cancer has a hold of me, that's fine, but I'm not letting go of God. Who's here today? You're going through hell. You're going through a struggle. Wondering if God is with you. And he says, listen, hold on to me in the struggle. God's not intimidated by how you feel. He, he's not intimidated by what's going on in your mind. He already knows. But will you hold on to him in the struggle? He held on to God in the struggle. God changed his mind. He realized deception wouldn't work. Now he had to trust God to be with him. Is someone here today, your struggle may be with your family. And you think about having to go back on the holidays to see your family members. And they always identify you from the mistakes that you used to make, the person that you used to be. And God is with you in the face of fear, God is with you. In the face of the failure, God tells him to go to his brother. When he sees his brother, his brother runs to him and he hugs him and puts his arms around him. Only God, only God could have done that. You mean to tell me you stole his birthright? You stole his covenant blessing. And when you go to meet him, and he could tell you're vulnerable, and the first thing he does when he sees you is run to you, wrap his arms around you, kiss you, and say, it's good to see you, my brother. You know God was at work, but God would not bless him until he faced his fear and faced his failure. And the only way he would experience the covenantal blessing was, was to surrender all that he used to be to receive all that he was going to be. And there's men and women in this room right now. God's not finished with you yet. He's not finished with you yet. He wants to change the way that you think. He wants to change what you used to identify with. And he wants to change the way that you walk. And he wants to do it all for his glory. But the only way he can do that is if you surrender all. When, when, when uh, he says that, Lord, I won't let go until you bless me, it means that I, I, re I relinquish all of who I am to receive all that you want me to be. And, and in fact, I talked to one of my, one of my, one of my uh, rabbi friends uh, from Israel, and he said it, it, his name is, is Israel, um, but if you change the vowels, uh, it, it's also, uh, 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 it changes it from not meaning that you just struggle with God, but if you change the vowels, it, it actually means that the, the straight path, the way to the straight path is in the struggle with God. He says that it does mean that you struggle with God, but it means that the, the, way, the way that you need to go, the way to a straight path, is only achieved in the wrestle, in the struggle. Which means that, that as believers, 
as men and women of God, that the, the only way we truly will be who God's called us to be is when we get in the, in the wrestle with him and the struggle with him. Because in the struggle with him, that we release all that we are and we receive all that he wants us to be. But it's in the struggle. And that's why I came to tell someone this morning that God is with you in the struggle.